Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Greenwood and Mulner Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Alongside myself, Jonathan Greenwood and Sam Mulner, we have a legend in terms of broadcasting in the North oh, East. In particular. Steady on. Steady on. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go for the big intro, Peter. is the Sky Sports News reporter slash presenter. I think he's been everything in terms of broadcasting when researching him. It is, of course, Pete Graves. Pete, welcome to the Greenwood and Mulner Show on Newcastle Fans TV. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. I wish I could come here on the back of a win. I think that was yeah. the my, my big hope. I could come on the back of a win and we could have some positivity. But uh, who knows how long we could be waiting for that. So let's just get it done, eh? Definitely. We'll have to reminisce about this positivity from uh, your time that we're obviously reporting about Newcastle. But um, when, we, when we were talking about this show a couple of months ago, Pete was one of the names that we had to go, right, let's try and see if we can get him on this show. And to, so to get him on is a, a real, real bonus, isn't it, Sam? Yeah, try, try. Shy Ben's getting out, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But thankfully, Pete got back to us, accepted, and uh, and here he is. And I think the big thing with Pete during lockdown particularly is when someone like Pete hops on his Instagram late one evening and says this takeover story is real, that makes everyone sit up and go, ooh. This is a bit different. How, how long were you sitting on that info, Pete, just about this, well, now failed takeover? Or is it failed? Well, how long was I sitting on the info? A long time. Um, September. It was a long time before it came out, put it that way. Really? And I, I was caught in a real quandary because um, Newcastle fans, of which I am one, have been through so much with failed takeovers. And I've always had this dream that when it happens, and I, I know that other fans share this, but that when it happens, it, nothing will be announced until it's signed, sealed and delivered. Because Newcastle fans don't want to know about it until it's done. I don't want to know about it until it's done either. That would be my perfect scenario. I'd love to wake up and, and just be told, oh, it's happened, and be able to report it's happened. But... Uh, now I got I got word that um, Amanda Stavely was coming back with Saudi royal money quite a long time before from a, from contact, but I didn't have enough to report it really anyway, and I wouldn't have done that because it was not long on the back of the uh, Dubai failed takeover, and the last thing the fan base I think needed was a, a, another sort of half-hearted link. Um, but then I think it was the the Wall Street Journal sort of posted it as a proper story, and once that happened. Um, we all sort of had to jump on and sort of go with everything that we had and ring all the contacts that we had. And all the noises that were coming from all the key, key contacts were like, yeah, this is this is real. And obviously I work closely with Keith Downey and, and there's other reporters in the sky who've got different contacts and different sides of it. Uh, oh, there he is. <laughs> Just to um, confirm they're two separate people. It's not the same person, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good old Keith. Um, hey, me and him get a battering, don't we? Dear me. Oh, we'll have to uh, mention, I'll mention that uh, a little bit later about that. <laughs> um, no, I, it, so everyone we rang and everyone we spoke to about it, I'm just going to make my, sorry about the jittery screen, I'm just going to make sure my battery's in. Um, yeah, said, said look, this this is it, this is, it's happening, it's real, um, it looked like terms have been agreed and uh and of course, the next the question mark that always comes up is, oh well, do they have the money to complete the deal? And are they the real deal? And with this one, it was like, oh yeah, they've got plenty of money to complete the deal. And this is going to be the one. And I was convinced that this time it would happen. But I wasn't the only one. I think the club were convinced as well. I think the buyers were convinced. And uh, and it, at the end of the day, it hasn't happened yet. Although I, I know that there's still things ongoing, I don't. I'm not talking about that because I just think that it's not fair. Because I think some fans are still probably checking daily to see if there's been an update, and it can drive you. It can honestly drives you potty, doesn't it? And I just want those fans to know that I'm the same. I, you know, I, I do all the stuff that you probably do. I, I go on on the Twitter and search the you know the NUFC hashtag and see if there's any random journalist on the other side of the world who's got a bit more information. And um, you know, and but I, I think it's really important that uh, and I, I kind of did a half hearted uh, sort of a, a, an apology um, to Newcastle fans afterwards on my Instagram, just sort of saying I felt a bit guilty because obviously, like you said at the start. 
people do hang on our every word and I would never ever report something that if I didn't think it was happening and I was getting carried away with it as well um and I really thought that this time was happening and uh it hasn't happened so far so yeah it's, it's for sure and I, and I, I really feel for the fan base and for the club because um you, you look certain that one thing was going to happen it hasn't happened and we're sort of now in this limbo and everyone else has moved on and football's carrying on and i think newcastle fans are sitting here going has everyone forgotten about what we've kind of been through this summer we've like gone from thinking we've both gone from getting linked with mbappe and then <laughs> next five minutes later it was like you know, you know is matty longstaff going to sign a new deal that was like sort of the 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 reality of you know, could we get Matty Longstock to sign a new deal became the priority like a couple of months after we thought we were going to sign, you know, the, the world world superstars. Um, so you just, we just got to carry on. Like, you know, I just think, and, and I do think in time that the club will get taken over. I just hope it's by the right people. Um, you know, I, said, I could, I could talk all day about it. So, you know, there, there, there's parts of the takeover. I get the human rights thing as well. And I know why some people are saying, you know, do you really want this? this group taking over your football club. But I just think taking all that away, I don't know enough about it. So I just think the club um, needed a fresh direction. And I, and I think, I don't think I, I can, I get myself in any problem by saying that because I think even Mike Ashley in, 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 wanted to move on as well. It seemed like every, all, the, all the, the ducks were aligned this time. The club wanted, the, you know, the owners wanted to sell the club. Uh, there were people there that wanted to buy it. And uh, I still, I'm still scratching in my head as, as to why it didn't happen. Does it almost feel like Pete, you were stuck between a rock and a hard place? Because as you mentioned, you're a passionate Newcastle fan, and then your job is to report on stories. So you almost feel like you can't win either way. It's yeah, and it, but that's part of the deal, I suppose. And it's like that with transfers, you know. It's. Uh, Something that fans maybe don't under appreciate is that sometimes a manager will say to you off the record, like, um, oh, we, 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 we're going to put a bid in for this player here. And you're like, oh, brilliant. Okay, so I it's all off the record. So you might do Sky Sauce in Newcastle are interested in signing this person. <laughs> and, you get a bit excited and your mates are what's happening. You're like, oh, they're really in a group. And you're like, yeah, yeah, and I've been told off the record. And then the club approaches the player the player says, no, nah, I don't fancy it. So then the next press conference, you go, so uh, what about this reported interest in that? No, nah, there's no interest in that play. And you think, oh, you've told me that you did want to sign. <laughs> <laughs> but because he doesn't want to come, now, it look, and then you get you pick up your phone and there's millions of people tweeting. You go, oh, you lied. You lied. <laughs> you didn't actually lie. I told what I was told in good faith. And it's just not happened for whatever reason. And the takeover was a bit like that. People still tweet me to this day saying, oh, uh, imminent, just just the word imminent. And I'm like, yeah, I did say it was imminent. But everyone was telling me. It wasn't like I was just, I didn't just wake up one morning over my cornflakes and go, oh, this will get a, this will get a few hits. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. That would be sort of career suicide. I, I was getting told that by, and we were getting told as, as a group, as Sky, we're getting told by amazing contacts from all different sides of it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But I understand fans' frustration. Just want them to know that I feel I felt it as well, <laughs> massively. I can imagine, like, yourself, Keith Downey, must dread transfer windows. Because whenever you, you report on anything, as you said there, it's just everyone's hounding you. And during the takeover as well, I remember George Colkin, bless him, became almost like a Newcastle agony aunt. Everyone on at him on Twitter every day going, George, what's going on? And the same with yourself and Keith. I mean, do you find it hard to switch off from Twitter? And when January comes, are you, do you kind of have to prepare yourself for the bombardment that you're inevitably going to get? Yeah, I don't mind really. I, you know, I think, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure George would say the same. And Keith, um, you try and always to be one of the ones I think that the fans can feel they can trust. And I know what you're saying with George and Keith because when they tweet something, you know, I'll, I'll be like, oh, yeah, this has got sort of, you know, we we can hang our hats on this one a little bit, you know. And there's there's others out there as well. Uh, no, the new the Northeast Press Pack are. A really, really good bunch of lads. Honestly, all of them. I mean, if 
from the from the local labs, uh, you know, the guys at uh, the Chronicle and uh, and elsewhere, and um, to all the guys covering Newcastle and the national media, I've you know I've got to know them all well over my time, particularly when I was working in local radio and local TV. But a lot of them cover the Republic of Ireland as well, and I used to cover the Republic of Ireland for Sky. So you know, like George, Luke Edwards, and, and others, and um, and they're all really good lads. And I hate seeing it when one one of them is getting battered for something. So I think ah, oh, don't, you don't understand, guys. They, they, this bloke's a really nice fella, and you get caught in that one tweak and one decision, tiny thing. We all make decisions every day. One tweak can kill you for for a month, you know. One decision to, you know, in my case, it was posing for a photo with Dennis Wise at a at a sportsman's dinner I did in London, and it didn't even cross my mind, right? But I was asked to host um, an England dinner in London and the, the main guests, there's always a couple of ex-England players there, and the main guests were Paul Ince and Dennis Wise. And um, one of my roles with that thing is that all the, all the fans queue up and they come and they meet and they get photographed with me, Dennis and Paul or whoever the guests are. And uh, the, the, uh, the photographer of the event, part of the deal that as well as that you, you tweet during the night and the photographer at the event took a photo of me, Dennis and Paul. And I put it out, it was a legends dinner and I put it out on my Twitter, like, are oh, you with a couple of legends watching England versus Holland? I can't remember the thing, the, were my wording exactly. And then when all filtered through for dinner, I'm sitting having dinner at a table and I've got Paul in there, Dennis Wise over there. And we're talking about England and Chelsea and, you know, my mate messaged me, my phone stopped buzzing. My, one, of my, one of my best mates messaged me. He said, you're going to have to delete that tweet. And I, I th thought about it for a second, and then I knew instantly why. I thought, oh. And he was like, I was like, oh, Newcastle fans are going mad. So I looked at it, and I, I was having dinner and trying to be polite without looking at my phone like this. So I sort of scrolled through, and I had millions of mentions. Like, the first one I saw was, don't ever show your face in St. James's Park again. So... I was like, oh, no, what have I done? So I panicked, and I deleted it straight away, and I thought, oh, that's that done. And then I carried on eating my dinner. And at this point, I'm not talking anymore to anyone around the table because I'm thinking, how – I'm, I'm starting to see it from the other side. I was like, oh, well, they all don't like Dennis Wise, and I, they think I... – so I, I then thought, right, I've deleted it. And I went back on, and then all the, like, lots of fans pages were saying, you may delete it, but the evidence is here. And they were, they were posting pictures of – like the picture that they'd screen grabbed and it was going more wild than before. So I thought, Oh no, what have I done? And then the stupidest decision ever, I thought, I'm just going to put it back out there. I've got to stick with it now. I deleted it. It was a bad idea. So then I reposted it again saying, look, I just want to upset a few people in this photo. I'm here in England did about, and I just, you know what, it was just one of those moments. And then my mentions were, were off the scale. And then I think that money Mike Ashley uh, account, which is quite funny on it at times. Posted a picture of that that picture of me and Dennis, but in the Gallagher end with all the flags, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it was it was it was it was um, it went down really badly. And I, you know I understand, but at the same time I wasn't thinking in those terms. But it's what I'm saying about local journalists: you you make one decision, and it can be it can become something massive. When in your mind, when you're doing it, you think, oh, I didn't mean to upset anybody, or. And other people with no following probably tweet stuff or do stuff all the time. Um, but yeah, that was one of the that was one of the tough things. But I, I would just say it fans like the Northeast Press lads are all good lads and um and they, they they don't you know they don't uh they don't always deserve the flight they get. They're, they're trying their best to inform everybody. And sometimes they get it wrong, but they'll never get it wrong on purpose. Yeah, rightly said. Well said, Pete. Um, we're talking about you a little bit and how it all started for you. I know you're obviously a massive Newcastle fan. I think everybody has seen that picture in the program. Uh, <laughs> again, well, there's obviously this one as well that we've managed to find. Um, it's, if, it it's for the Newcastle shirt, if it wasn't for the Newcastle shirt, it'd look like you're going to see the Stone Roses. <laughs> well, I'm a massive Stone Roses fan as well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I don't know what the eyebrow ring was all about. That was a strange. Thing. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, Newcastle. Um, New, uh, you know, Newcastle's in my blood, like supporting the team, um, and it still is to this day. I'm really missing it. 
and I know it's sort of you're not allowed to say that you like going to the match anymore. But my dad's pushing 80. My son is nine. Um, we go to the match together and sit together in the Milburn stand. And uh, that is the only time really that my dad, who means the world to me, obviously, and my son um, spend that quality time together. It's through the 90 minutes of dross or the, the occasional um, great win. I mean, last season, Newcastle beat Chelsea with a last minute winner. They beat Man United. They got a, a draw against Man City. They were great days, man. I mean, with me, my dad and my son jumping around in the Melbourne stand. And I love all the crack that you get and the sort of the grief you get from some of the fans. I mean, the majority of fans in the stadium are absolutely fantastic, you know, when they, when they chat to you. It's um, a very different experience to reading your, your Twitter timeline. I'm not sure how many of those people abusing everyone on Twitter actually go at the game. Well, they, they don't actually because they make a point of telling you that they don't go anymore. But for me, it's... Uh, it's a way of life. It has been since I was a, a very little boy. I went with my dad then, and we still go now. And my son comes along now, and he's the age I was when I started going. Um, it's more than football. It's uh, it's a way of life. And um, I'll never regret a single game I went to with my dad and my son. Um, and the people say, you shouldn't be going. You, you support in the regime. At, I will not stay away from St. James's Park when I've been going since I was a kid. And I started going in there. Um, Jim Smith was the manager when I went to my first game. And there's been some bleak times in my lifetime of supporting Newcastle. Um, and I'm talking about you know, 14,000 people there on a Tuesday night when the, when the fans again were, were, were protesting against the way the club. Had, it's been going on forever. It's never been great. <laughs> apart from those two, apart from when under Kevin Keegan and Bobby Robson for that spell. The rest of it's been pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> so it's it's nothing new, and uh, and I look at it now with sort of this mid-table Premier League team, um, and you know, it, it, new owners might come in and take us there. New owners might come in, by the way, and take us there. Mm. And you know, it, you just don't know what's going to happen. And for me, you just got to keep supporting a football club. Is you just got to keep supporting them, come through rain or shine. Um, and that's always been my mentality. I'm not one of them. I don't leave before the end of the game, wait till the very final whistle. And I'm, I'm very much like it's you, you've, you've just got to you got to stick with it, whatever's happening. Um, and I hope. Listen, I've missed it. I hope that when um, fans are allowed back in the stadium again, that first game um, when it, you were allowed to full St James's Park, I'm already excited and getting shivers down my spine at the thought of being packed to the rafters and the noise when the when the players run out because it it won't just be football then it'll be it'll be a, it'll be a, a, the, the biggest sign of, of life returning to normality uh, so i can't wait but yeah i've supported them since i was a little kid there's the picture on the program you mentioned which is completely random but um was uh was fantastic to turn up in the match and see my my face on the front of a program which i had no idea it's not like today when i guess they have to contact the kid and double check it's all right i mean i had no idea Turned up and and uh, there I was. Lucky I wasn't bunking off school or something. <laughs> I'd have been found out. But uh, oh, fantastic! Yeah, it's it's framed in my um in my garage at home with it with a few other Newcastle bits and bobs. And that's my uh, this is my flat. I'm in my flat in London now, and that's a signed shirt that Time Tees gave me when I was um. Uh, it's signed by she. It's the Bobby Robson team, actually. But I helped um, helped on the documentary of uh, Alan Shearer, all of his goals on D get it on DVD with Roger Thames doing the doing the commentary. And I was just I was a researcher. If you go onto the, you've got the DVD at home. It's all of Shearer's goals. Yeah, and I've it, got it. It, it says research. If you go in the credits at the end, researcher is Pete Graves. I was only allowed, but I had to separate them all up in the right foot, left foot, header, volley. Uh, it was a great, and the and Ty and T's gave me that shirt at the end as a thank you. So I wasn't getting paid; I was doing it on a voluntary basis. So uh, it hangs up there. All oh, some great players on that shirt, by the way. It's a, that probably must be the best job you've ever done. Even though you didn't get yeah. paid for it, I go for Alan Shearer's goals for Newcastle, having to separate them. I'll probably watch it five or six times over just to make sure. But, yeah, uh, uh, it was great. I've had some. I've had some amazing jobs. I've been the luckiest person in the world. And when I do have a bad week and I moan. My mates are the first to tell me to, to shut the hell up and stop moaning about it. <laughs> I'm extremely fortunate. I was just going to say, because you've obviously been 
obviously hospital radio very very early on radio tyneside metro yeah. radio commentator yeah when your metro radio commentator was that the first time you've gone wow i'm actually commentating on my beloved team obviously it was with uh the first game i've got to add that correct me if i'm wrong was against portsmouth nil nil so yeah. you, got one of, you got one of the best games obviously uh, yeah well I, it, that saved me that because it was a nil nil nothing happened and actually um i only found out i was doing it on the friday because Justin Lockwood, who a lot of you will know, um, he does the match day stuff at St. James's, but he's also, I think he did heart radio until recently. He was the commentator and um, his missus, he was having his, was expecting their first child. And I think she went into labor. I mean, Justin will know about I think she went into labor early or something and he couldn't do Portsmouth away was too much of a risk for if she went into labor, he wouldn't be able to get back. So I think they they sort of con considered a whole list of uh, like well-known commentators and couldn't get any of them because it was Friday and the game was on Saturday. In the end, they were stuck with me. And uh, it was Mick Martin was usually the co-commentator, but he couldn't do it either. So it ended up being me and Jim Pearson, who, who played a few games for Newcastle back in the day, but he'd never been on the radio either. So we turned up and I, got, <laughs> I went down to Portsmouth <laughs> with a little box and this machine and... Um, and uh, plugged in and had no idea what I was doing. But because it was nil-nil and very little happened, the hard bit when you're commentating is a goal, keeping your excitement level down, making sure you're, you're making sense, and uh, but still getting that balance between being passionate and not going over the top, which as a Newcastle fan was always quite hard for me. But because it was nil-nil, I just sat there, got through the game, and at the end of it, the boss of the radio station was like, oh, you did really well. You were fine. They were like, oh, do, do the rest of the season because there was only a few games left, I think. And, uh, and that was it. From then on, I, I sort of took over. Justin concentrated on being a daddy with his new baby, which was a right decision. And, uh, and uh, he was kind enough to let me carry on the, uh, the commentary. Um, and I loved it. Absolutely loved commentating on the games, uh, doing every single game home and away, um, traveling with the team sometimes to European games as well like on the – remember flying out to one European game in the UEFA Cup. And um, I think that was, I was, it must have been like, I must have been early 20s. So I'd been on the drink the night before. I'd been out in Newcastle and I'd sort of turned up at the airport early, hung over and got on this flight with the Newcastle players and fallen asleep on the plane. And I remember waking up on a plane and seeing Nobby Solano was the first person I saw on a plane with a hangover and thinking, is this actually happening right now? <laughs> Yeah. I've, oh, listen, I've had some, I've been so lucky, man. See, as a Newcastle fan, I do some of the things I've done. Um, you know, work, work with Sir Bobby Robson. I did a documentary on his life and uh, got to know him very well in his later years. And uh, yeah, that was, um, that was something that will stay with me, with me forever. Is he the best manager that you've seen at the club or would you say Kevin Keegan? When he I, can't, I, get the I, can't, I can't split uh, Sir Bobby and Kevin. I really can't. Um, I still speak to Kevin regularly um, and uh, we call each other up and he's such a... They are both the best people you could possibly imagine. And you know the, the, the thing that you never meet your heroes. Um, those two guys are... are, are they, they'll give you advice, like life advice, and it's the best you've ever heard. I spoke to Kevin once and, and I was when we were expecting our third child and I was, I was like, I'm in a third baby. And he, and he, he just he came up with a one line or something like, oh, yeah, my daughter didn't want three either, but you know what? That third baby's brought more joy to their life than they ever could have imagined or something like that. Like, anyway, speak to you later. Someone put the phone down. And I was like, <laughs> Made me feel so much better about everything. And, and Bob, so Bobby was the same. When I got offered the job at Sky, my wife didn't want to move to London. And uh, he said to her, he said, look, Elsie didn't want to move to Eindhoven. He didn't, she didn't want to move to Barcelona. She didn't want to move to Porto either. But she loved the ride. She loved every single time, she, every single club I went to. And, and with that, my missus was convinced. So he, uh, he convinced her to move down to London um, at the time when I got the job at Sky. So had it not been for Sir Bobby, I might not have ever been able to take the job at Sky, so I have to thank him for that as well. But um, she's back in Newcastle now, of course. So uh, yeah, yeah. No, they're both amazing people. They're both everything that you you read and you hear. Um, so I couldn't split the two of them, and I thank them because without those two, if you take them two out of my life support in Newcastle, it wouldn't be very good at all. <laughs> not at all, not at all. But Sam, 
obviously Pete's probably seen everything in terms of Newcastle, but yeah, I think what I, I think, forgive me if I'm wrong, Pete, but was one of your biggest stories the obviously the Kevin Keegan resigning because that was your main national television debut, if I believe yeah. it, in terms of like and obviously being on tying tees, of course, but nationally. I'll bring Sam in just for this a little bit before I will go on to the question, but when Kevin Keegan resigned the second time, Sam, that was a huge story. I think every kind of every Newcastle right. fan knew it happened on my happened. it happened on my birthday as well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as well, listening to Pete there about Sir Bobby and, and um, Kevin Keegan. I mean, oh, I wish I was a bit older so Sir Bobby could have been on hand to try and convince my missus to move up to the northeast because <laughs> still stuck in the still stuck in the Midlands, and that's the way it's going to stay. So I'm told, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, that Kevin Keegan one, it just kind of signified the start of the rot, really, under Mike Ashley, didn't it? It was just the start of a real toxic period. How do you manage, Pete, when you've got to report on something so crap, <laughs> which is Newcastle-based? I mean, I'm sure you, some of your colleagues that are Sunderland fans at Sky Sports News revel in it, but when you've got to report on stuff like that and collapse takeovers and this, that and the other, how do you kind of keep yourself pepped? uh yeah it's not easy like it's not it's not always easy take um trying to not be a fan and some people are really good at it in my profession they're very professional those that work with me know i'm not always the most professional and i i sometimes do let my emotions get in in the way of my performance um which isn't a good thing and any youngsters watching this trying to get into sports journalism you've got to try and remain professional at all times but it, it's all i mean sometimes even just going on air i i work on a saturday and I'll, I'll watch the we're a privileged position at Sky and just watch all the games as they're coming in. You've got feeds coming into the building. So you're sitting, you're, you're watching the Newcastle game. If Newcastle get beat, I have to then go on air after. I'm just, I'll watch back afterwards. I've, I've literally done my shift like this. Uh, I'm just, I take, really take it out of me. I think, oh, next time Newcastle lose, I've got to have to put in, I've got to up, put in over like more energy. People tweet you going, I can see you, see you annoyed about the get result or. Um, but yeah, it, reporting on a failed takeover is hard. I don't want to ever have to do that again. I'm sick to the teeth of takeovers. Um, just want the next one to happen. But as, as I said right at the top, uh, yeah, it is, it is difficult to remain in professional when, when your heart's invested in something. Um, you know, we get carried away when things are good and we get really down in the dumps when things are bad. That's part of being a football fan. Uh, but yeah, it's not it's not always easy. But I do try. I think I've got I've marginally better over the years. It's sort of uh, trying to separate my emotions and uh, and my professionalism. But it's 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 one of the toughest tougher sides of the job for sure. I remember going on air straight after I was doing the news at ten and Newcastle playing Arsenal. This was ages ago, and the Arsenal scored. It was at the at the Emirates, and Arsenal scored in like the last second. It was nil nil. It's all the way to it, or and Arsenal scored in like the last second. And I had to go straight on air. And I was just like so deflated. And the news at 10 on Sky Sports News is, is one of our highest ranking shows audience-wise because it, traditionally it's like when every, the kids have all come to bed and everything's settled down and people watch Sky Sports News at 10 for a summary of the day. And so it's one where you've got to really give it loads of energy. And I must have, I was I was absolutely terrible. I just went on. I was like, oh, well, it was Sky Sports News. <laughs> I was so annoyed about the... Uh, the last minute Arsenal winner. Uh, so yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, but then you get to discuss the highs, and I think one moment in particular um, is Miguel Almiron when he signed for the football club, mm. and you're live. You're literally in the main man, and you're telling everybody, not just Newcastle fans, but you're just telling everybody that Newcastle have broken their transfer record on a yeah. player that Rafa Benitez has been after for for a team an eternity. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a really good day to do that on the January uh, the January deadline day, and both myself and Keith were involved. But I I was lucky enough to actually break the line that the deal had been done, and it was all on the big yellow. Uh, Newcastle had broken the transfer record, and <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it was it was brilliant to do that. It was it was great, and, and at the time as well, I think because I was obviously desperate for Rafa to stay at the club, as as, as all fans were, and this was the. Um, this was the player that he wanted to sign. And I think that, if I'm not mistaken, I think they'd just beaten Man City as well, or they just were about to beat Man City in the league. 
And then there's, uh, there's that moment where there's a text on my phone. I don't want to go too much into it because obviously we, we have our, our sources. But I, 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 at that point, I thought, well, Rafa's definitely going to stay because we, we've signed Almiron. We've beaten Man City. Everything's coming into play. And I thought Rafa will sign a new deal. And it just felt like the club was starting to sort of move in a good direction. Um, but obviously, despite that sign and he, he still uh, he still didn't stay which was was a shame and, and off he went but uh, he did he did a great job Rafa um, and uh, and people get very emotional about him and I, I know he's, he's struggling a bit out in China right now by all accounts but uh, he's a lovely lovely man um, and um, and uh, I think staying when they went down to the championship said a lot about him um, and uh, and he, he did a great job you know he did it he did a great job and he was, he's a tactician I do a lot of work with Jamie Carragher and um, Carragher talks about what a great uh, tactical manager Rafa was. Not necessarily a, not necessarily one that puts his arm around players and that players feel like warm from, like Sir Bobby. Um, I think Steve Bruce is quite like that. I think the, the players really like Steve Bruce as a, you know, as a person. He puts his arm around them and he's, he's got a, he, we all know Steve Bruce is a really, really nice bloke. He's like one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your life. Honestly, he's such a nice fella. I hate seeing him get get grief because uh, um, he is he's he's a, he's, a, he's a really really top guy, and the players do like him as well. I can tell you that for a fact, they do like him, and uh, he's uh, he's very different type of manager to Rafa. Rafa, who's a tactical genius, um, and, uh, and and but Steve Bruce has got more of the. I've got to be careful what I say, but if you're going to be type of manager, he's more of a the of a Sir Bobby in that he's he's a someone to put his arm around a player and and encourage. And Bobby wasn't a great tactician. I mean, the people say his training sessions it was just like it was old school, like just dribble around the cones and whack it in the net. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he could make players feel a uh, feel a million dollars, you know, as he did with Shearer. Brought Shearer back in from the cold, and look what. Look how Alan played when when Sir Bobby came in, um, and I think Steve Bruce has got that about him. He's he's um, he's certainly one who can make the players feel good about themselves. Um, but I know the fans aren't convinced yet, uh, and I know the fact he managed Sunderland. And I I saw the other day someone putting clips out of him speaking on Sky Sports when. Um, when Newcastle beat Man United uh, five 0 and said, "Oh, look at this! You see, how can you say he's a Newcastle fan?" Because he was sort of talking glowingly about Manchester United on the day. But fans have got to understand. I think when you've been captain of, even if you've been brought up supporting Newcastle, which he was, if you've been captain of a football club and they've been paying your wages for your entire career and you've won every trophy under the sun, you're going to get an affinity with that football club, you know. And Newcastle fans. You know whether you like it or not. If if you've got um, because Jamie Carragher, I mentioned, he's a great example. His family were staunch Everton fans. I mean, they were every single game home and away. He got signed for Liverpool as a kid, and he's obviously became this Liverpool legend. His whole family support Liverpool now. His whole family, because they've followed him. They won the Champions League, and Newcastle fans are find this really hard to accept. And I get it, I do. But if you've got a little lad who's seven or something like that and he's got a great you know great potential as a footballer if he then goes and signs for let's think of a club that i'm not going to say Sunderland, but let's say it signs for aston villa right for example oh it's another bad example especially from where i'm from <laughs> the reason why i've used them the reason why i've used them is because there's a bit of history between newcastle fans and villa fans right so if you've got a i want newcastle fans to imagine you've got a son who's not a bad player he's going to sign foot terms now for villa and you're going to start going to support your kid. And he has a whole career where he plays in the Premier League and he wins trophies. And You're probably going to move your whole family to the Midlands. There's going to be an element of you're going to become, uh, you're going to grow a great affinity with that club. You're not going to then turn up with your son playing like number nine for Aston Villa and all your family in a box and all that. And, and, and the, when Newcastle come into town, you're still going to support Villa on that day. It's got the, the so, and I, I thought that about Steve Bruce the other day. It was like people saying, "Look, he's, he wants Man United to win." He, he, I think he was still at the club, or so you know. The, there are some things that change you in football. Um, where it, but if you don't work in the game or don't play the game, it's hard to understand. But um, I, I, I just, 
I'm one of those that I think that I think he's done all right. I think he's done all right, you know. I think anyone, I think it was a it was a massive poison chalice taken over from Rafa, who the fan absolutely loved and rightly so. You know, to come in, whoever came in next was gonna get a hard ride. He came in and it was almost gonna be even an even harder ride because there's certain managers might have come in and thought, oh well, you know, I think Mourinho was free at the time. People were talking about Mourinho, can they get Mourinho? When Steve Bruce was appointed, you thought, oh, you knew what the reaction was going to be. And I think people were saying they were going to go straight down and get relegated. I think he's done okay, like so far. Um, and I think this he's got some good players there. And at times that there's been some good performances and there's been some bad ones as well. Um, but you know, I think it's we just got to see what happens. There's some tough games coming up. There could be a tough run coming up. So we want to see what happens. Fingers crossed, hopefully, for the future for Newcastle, of course. Sam, if you get offered a role to go and be a presenter or any part of Sky Sports, you're going to take it with both hands and you're going to make sure you keep a hold of it as long as possible. Um, Pete's been in that very privileged position to have that role for over 10 years now. Sam, what would you be like if you got told that you had a job at Sky Sports? Because I think you'd be shouting, telling everybody that you've got a job and it, at such a very well-respected company. I mean, you're reflecting your own personal ambitions onto me now, aren't you, Johnny? That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's one of these things to work in, to work in sport, to work in football. To, to I mean, I, I want to wake up on a plane and see Nobby Solano. <laughs> that's, that's just the best thing ever. I take Nobby Solano just having him on this podcast. To be fair, but yeah, it, it's just do you sort of have to pinch yourself, Pete? Still to this day, look. You've got Kevin Keegan in your phone book. You wake up half cut seeing Nobby Solano. It's just, it sounds just the best thing ever. Yeah, it is. It's the best. It is. I've been so fortunate. Um, I've got the best job in the world. I work with some amazing people at Sky. And, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a very privileged position. So yeah, I'm, 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 I've been, you know, I've loved every second of it to be honest. But you never know when it could come to an end. You have got to enjoy it, you know. It's, I've, you know, I've, I've loved everything from doing the the local radio, hospital radio stuff when I started to doing the commentary and then working my up, working my way up. And my ambition was always to work at Sky Sports as a as a, as a kid. As soon, basically, as soon as Sky Sports news started, I was, I was obsessed with the channel. I watched it daily, and when I got the job, I didn't quite believe it. Um, and I, when I went to the office for the first time and I was getting introduced to everyone. I was like, you don't need to tell me anyone's names. I know everyone. I know them all. I even know the guys in the background who only go on once a year. I know who they are. And, <laughs> uh, but to be honest with you, I wasn't ready either. I'd had a short amount of time doing local radio and local TV. And I'd, I'd had a, quite a meteoric rise. I'd gone from hospital radio, flown through, got a metro radio, done the commentary there. Then Century Radio liked me, so they took me there, and I did the commentary of Century with Bobby Moncur, uh, who's another great man, by the way. And uh, and then um, and then I'd gone to Tyne Tees. I'd only been at Tyne Tees a matter of months, Tyne Tees TV, and uh, and I got the opportunity to go to Sky. So I turned up at Sky thinking, I'm absolutely mint at this. <laughs> Every time I get a job, a better one comes along five minutes later. And I arrived at Sky, and that, that was probably around then. Look at the state of that. And uh, and, uh, and, that, and then I suddenly realised I wasn't really good enough to be there, I think, because the standard was so good. I mean, you've got the best broadcasters, you know, in, in the world for me, some of them working at Sky Sports, and I, I was nowhere near. And the first time I went on, I sat I sat in the chair. I thought, I'm ready for this. I'm ready for this. I'm ready for this. And then you have the count in the ear, counting down from 10. And there's screens everywhere at Sky. There's TVs everywhere, millions of them. And it went five, four, three, two, one, bang. And the lights came on. And I just was suddenly aware that my face was everywhere in the office. And I literally was like a rabbit in the headlights. I'd look, I'd, hopefully that that first appearance is gone from the system because I just... <laughs> I couldn't swim. It's like when you jump into a, into a swimming pool and the water's too cold. I was like, uh, um, but uh, and I wasn't ready. And it took me, I'm still not ready, to be honest. <laughs> I'm still making mistakes and uh, and getting overly excited and losing my professionalism. And, um, 
and you know I'm still trying to learn from people around me who are very good at their job and uh, you're still learning about social media that's a whole new thing and you know not tweeting things you know if like I said with the takeover now until it's like completely done and dusted I'm just staying out of it now because I think it's people's emotions at play and um and uh and you don't want to raise hopes um uh, people will say are oh, you doing it for clicks as well I've never done that not, clicks don't mean anything to uh, me I never understand that because what are you gaining from a click like what no. is, it just doesn't make any sense I've never understood that I feel I feel a genuine responsibility to try and because I'm a Geordie and I'm from the Northeast uh, to try and keep people informed. Um, and I saw so, so my mates on the WhatsApp groups and message me every day. Oh, I heard about this, I heard about this. And, you know, I sort of try and keep them a little bit informed if I can with what I know. And I think, well, if I'm doing it for them, I'll try to do it for everyone else. So I try and just pass on what I do know. But then you, you, you run in a dangerous game, as we found out, because then when things don't happen, you get the blame. So you think, well, I'm, is it worth it? Is it worth raising people's hopes? But then I'm excited. So I'm like, oh, I want everyone else to feel the same as me. This is happening. Let's get excited about it together. It's all been together. And that moment when you're reporting that positive news and everyone's, you know, all the gifts are coming out. And it's like, it's happening. And you're like, yes, it's happening. You're as excited as everyone else. And then when it doesn't happen, everyone's gutted. And you're the one sitting there with your phone. And I was like, well, this is, I was the one that said it was. And that's an awful feeling. You feel an immense amount, an immense amount of responsibility. Yeah, of course. You've obviously broadcasted by the Republic of Ireland, which you mentioned uh, at the start of the show. Is there another role at Sky that you really want to get your teeth into? Because obviously you've done a bit of obviously broadcasting, as we've mentioned with Ireland. You've obviously done Sky Sports News reporting for God knows how many years. But is there something else? Is there, is there something missing, Pete, that you want to do? Uh, I, I quite like to help um, other presenters, younger presenters coming up because... I think sometimes the, 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 the best managers are ne aren't necessarily the ones who are the best players. And I think I've, I went through um, so many different uh, challenges as a presenter trying to get to a level where I thought I was good enough to be at Sky. I think I could help a presenters maybe not make the same mistakes I made, worrying about things that you shouldn't be worried about when you're on air. Um, you know, uh, was that with who was that? Was that with you guys? Yeah, yeah certainly on the right who's the main the main presenter of the well he's the creator newcastle fans tv and rob who yeah, yeah, used to be yeah. on the channel as well i remember that yeah that was that was a good i, th I think that might have been the day it says window closed in the background they've obviously got the boys out in the in the <laughs> in the key part of the day that must have been about midnight look at them the knackers <laughs> but uh no it's uh yeah i'd quite like to help younger presenters coming up I, I do really enjoy working on sky sports news when i started there it was uh you just sat at the desk and you didn't move for sort of four hours now you've got the massive video wall you do social media um screen you, there's the there's the sky pad so you're kind of always on your feet and and uh and and bopping around the studio and I, I like that because i'm quite a, an energetic person when i'm on air so um i really enjoy sky sports news so um i used to, uh, because i'd done matches previously on radio i'd always presented newcastle games i think i naturally when i first went to sky and i used to do the england under 16s games and and i think i was naturally a better fit for live football when i first arrived at sky but obviously, with, with Sky Sports News, you do so many hours in that chair doing the news that I've actually, I think, over time, I think I'm now a better fit for that. Um, so, no, I just, and within Sky Sports News, a lot of great shows. Like Deadline Day, I, I like being a part of that. Um, you know, so, you know, and it, it's, I'm 38 now, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, you, you're looking at some of the other big shows within Sky, and you think, you know, in the next few years, could, could you do that? But listen, if I'm just working on Sky Sports News, doing what I do now for for the rest of my life, then I'll, I'll be extremely fortunate. And, I, you know, I'd, I'd be very happy to look back on a career working there for – I've been there 10, 10 plus years. I'd love to work there for 20, 25, 30 years if I can. Um, so, yeah, the only the only odd bit is my family's up in Newcastle now. I've got three kids and wife up in Newcastle. Um, Sky's down here in London. So I do an awful lot of travelling and an awful lot of uh, – spend an awful lot of hours in this flat where I am, which is a beach. You can't see it, but it – it's barely big enough to swing a cat. Um, but I spend a lot of my life in here uh, with my PlayStation 4. 
playing FIFA and winning trophies for Newcastle. So you, you may you don't win anything. You're wrong because uh, we've won everything there is to win in this this little uh, studio apartment in London. Trust me. Fantastic. There's Sam, it's Wolves at the weekend. Obviously, they've just beaten Leeds on Monday Night Football by yeah. Bolton. I thought they were a very impressive second half. And I think Newcastle don't have a bad record at Molineux, has to be said. I think the last um, time Newcastle lost was an FA Cup game in the early 2000s. Yeah. So it tells you that Newcastle don't do too bad against Wolves, but this is a different Wolves team now from uh, yesteryear, isn't it? And do you think Newcastle have got a chance to get anything this weekend, Sam? I mean, that Wolves team now, it's so much different to the one that uh, George undarred us in uh, 02 or 03 in, uh, in the FA Cup, as you mentioned. What a horrendous day that was. I don't... I've just got horrible memories going into school the next day. Because obviously, where I am, it's um, heavily Aston Villa and Wolves orientated, which isn't the best. But, um, yeah, this Wolves team now, or Portugal B or A or whatever, just Portugal plus Connor Cody, isn't it? They're... Um, <laughs> They're a great. They're, they're. We kind of look at them in envy now because they've had the takeover. They're. They've got a nice, slow, progressive build going on. That's. That's really going places. And you think, well, we want that. We kind of had that under Sir Bobby in a way. The real exciting progression and exciting times. But like you say, we've got a half decent record there. Um, what do you make of it, Pete? What do you think? We've got any sort of hope? We've got a terrible run of um, tricky fixtures coming up, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, I think we've got to hope. I think it's easy to um, start panicking, hit the panic button, because we got uh, tonked off Man United at the weekend. But football, if, if Callum Wilson takes that chance, which he'd have backed himself nine times out of ten, you go two on up and it's a different game. And I know he didn't deserve to win, but uh, Bruce has found a way of sometimes uh, getting a result out of a game that... Um, that you don't think they're going to be able to. So I think, yeah, we've got a chance. I think a Wolves away, I always think of... Uh, I, I was I was in the in the, uh, in the the away end for the um, for the game where they scored that last minute. Is it Bolly? And it was a massive foul on the Bradford. How is that not a foul? VAR. It should have come in a season. So. I was absolutely fuming about that. And, um, yeah, so that, and I think I think Mickey Ambron made his debut yeah. that same yeah. night. Came off the bench. And me and my mates were like, oh, look how quick he is, you know. And uh, <laughs> Isaac Hayden scored it scored for us, I believe. He just yeah. fired one from the keeper and they scored They scored in the last second. But, uh, yeah, I think we've got a chance. We've got a chance. I actually think we're um, – yeah, it's weird being a football fan. We beat West Ham and I thought we're brilliant. And then we're off against Brighton. I thought we're absolutely terrible. And then <laughs> we get a win and I'm like, oh, we're actually – and I go from thinking we're going to finish – we've got a chance of getting into the Europa League to think we're going to get relegated. It's never anywhere in the middle. So I was like, oh, we're top seven here. And then I'm like, no, we're going to get relegated. Um, I think we've got a chance to pull off a result. I really like the signings that they made in the window. We just saw Callum Wilson there. I think it's a brilliant signing. Um, I think that Jamal Lewis has got a great uh, future ahead of him. Um, obviously, we know Liverpool tried to sign him. Uh, and uh, you know Jeff Hendrick, I think is a good squad player. Um, Bruce likes him; he's a steady, no-nonsense midfielder. But uh, playing him in a four, it means he can have Shelby, Hayden, and Hendrick as a, as a sort of middle three, effectively. And it lets the fourth player, whether that's that's been Alan San Maximan or or Miggy Almiron, it leaves them to just do what they want. Um, so I think it's quite. He, he was quite a clever signing as well, um, and uh, and obviously you've got. We haven't seen the best of Ryan Fraser yet, but I tell you what, he looked quality for Scotland in the two games that I saw him playing, and uh, and he's looked decent when he's played for Newcastle as well in the, in that in that last game. Um, he, oh, who was it? Was it Burnley? Who, I'm trying to think who we beat at last time when Callum Wilson yeah, scored. Burnley. Burnley, yeah, and they uh, obviously showed his pace to get the pen, which uh, Wilson Wilson scored. Um, so he's yeah, he's he's a great signing as well, and even even Gillespie, the goalkeeper. I know he had the clangor in the League Cup, but the game before against Blackburn, he played really well, and I think he's good cover for uh, with the draft crowd. He's good cover for Dallas. We had a really good window, um, and I think I think we've got a decent team. I think we're I think we're about tenth. Um, at the minute, uh, I think that's where that's where we are. Anything above should be seen as uh, is, a, is a good season this season. Anything above ten, anything below, I think we've just gone under par. I think par for us this season's ten. Uh, looking at all the other squads and where I think we we've, we've strengthened. Um, so yeah, I think that that should be Steve Bruce's aim to try and finish in the top ten. 
but we yeah we're mid, we're mid table again. But I tell you what, it takes a lot of hell of a lot of work to to get you from from sort of mid table up to that that next that next stage, which is like challenging the top seven. Uh, we're two or three players short of that at the minute, I think. But um, you know that we'll have to see what what January brings. Not long till the next window. I'm still yeah, recovering yeah. from that. And it's about to open up again. <laughs> yeah, you'll soon be getting tweaks. Why haven't we signed such and such? I mean, yeah. I would argue that that trio of signings, in particular Lewis, Wilson and Fraser, that's good business takeover or no takeover. If we'd have been taking over them three yeah. for a first window post-takeover, I think it would have been cracking business. But yeah. it, it would have just required one or two more, don't you think? Yeah, it would have been. And I think there would have been one or two more. Um, but yeah, I agree. I still would have. Won. I still think Newcastle should have been trying to sign those players, regardless of who owned the club. And I think that I think that everyone there deserves a lot of credit because I didn't think they were going to sign anyone. Honestly, I didn't. I thought after the takeover, it seemingly gone away. I didn't think any any money was going to get spent. I think I thought they would keep the money in the club. Any money that was there, I thought they'd keep it in the club and just try and make it as an attractive proposition as possible for someone to buy. But um, I think Steve Bruce worked extremely hard to get those players that he wanted. And they were all there. They were all sort of players that he wanted. And it was quite rare to see the club sort of back a manager like that. But, you know, I think he played a big role in it. And you know what? Steve Nixon's someone that doesn't get spoken about too much. But I thought it was interesting that uh, Alan St. Maximan gave him a lot of credit as well for the work he did to get Alan St. Maximan over. And, um, I think there's, I think there's some, there's so many good people at the club, you know. Uh, fans um, maybe get frustrated with certain things, but there's a lot of great people. I mean, like even in the media departments, the corporate departments, there's uh, all the way through the club. There's a lot. There's a lot of people who are. A lot of them are staunch Newcastle United fans as well. I think fans sometimes fall into a trap of thinking, oh, they work for the club, so they're on, they're on the payroll, so they're somehow part of the problem, but. Most of the people that work at Newcastle United are massive Newcastle fans who've wanted to work there their entire lives, you know. Um, and uh, and they also, you know, they'll not be able to say anything, but they're, they're, they'll hear a lot of the, the realities of what goes on. And a lot of it's good. A lot of it's good. Um, you know, the, the foundation do amazing work for the community yeah. and they do so much stuff. And a lot of it goes, doesn't get spoken about. And then one one bad thing, you know, gets absolutely blown 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 up so i do feel a bit sorry for the the guys that work at the club sometimes they're fighting fires all the time as well but we wouldn't want to change the fan base though because we're we're the most passionate fan base in the world for me and you know uh, we care so much it's more than just supporting a football team it's a it's it's a love affair isn't it and we just want it to be the best it can possibly be and that's totally understandable but there 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 are a lot of good people at the club and uh you know, and I've said it on Steve Bruce, but there's other former legends as well that get that, that get sort of a bit of a hard time. And I'm thinking about Bobby Moncur comes to mind, who I worked with for years. Last man to lift the trophy at Newcastle. And sometimes he, I sometimes see people having a go at him. I think, oh my, I mean, he absolutely adored Newcastle United. And he's, he was one that when they put him on the, the, the that board that they had for a while, he was the one that was always really pushing for, um, for the club that makes signings, and he, you know he's he gets it, he gets it, and he gets the fans. Shola Amiobi is another one that started get. They've started having a go at him. I think oh, he used to. Shola used to live, grew up within a stone's throw of the football ground. He was one of them that used to offer to watch your car. He told me he used to watch the car there, and then when he got taken to a game for the first time and watching the match and what dreaming of being a Newcastle player, he's achieved that. Now that I see him getting grief because he. He didn't. He didn't. He decided not to go on television and absolutely, de- you know, destroy the the ownership of the club. Think, oh, come on, guys! Hey, you know, it's he's, he, he absolutely adores Newcastle United. Um, so yeah, I think we've got to back our own. I would like to see. I'd like if I say one thing. I say it would be nice to, to all get together as fans. Lots of different fan groups and factions. And I see people giving this person grief and this, and I get some. And Keith gets some. Other journalists, I just think if we could all come together and all sort of back each other up and work more as a as a unit, we'd be the most powerful unit ever, as we've seen at times. So yeah. Anyway, sorry, that's a bit of a rant. I've just no, there. it's all right. It's it's, it's great to hear, Pete. It's great to hear because it's like we want everybody to be united, essentially, and it's it it, it 
goes in well with everything that we've um, we've, we've talked about with in the last few months in particular. But you talked about the passionate fan base who deserve a trophy, and Bob Monkeo is the last person to lift a trophy for Newcastle. I have to mention the Carabao Cup because we've got Brentford, not too probably far from where your flat is right now. Pete, yeah. Um, obviously, I know it's a couple of days before Christmas, but do you think this is Newcastle's best chance to realistically get to maybe a semi-final or even a final in a competition that, let's be honest, the big six in particular don't really give it a lot of thought, mm. if we're being brutally honest. Well, not after watching Ivan Tony last night. because <laughs> <laughs> And I, I've, I've got another bee in my bonnet about this because <laughs> Ivan Tony. I was watching. I was working at Sky News last night. So I watched it. I watched a bit of Blackburn as well, and Adam Armstrong's another one. Um, Dan Barlas, uh, um, a Jamie Sterry used to without a club. There's a there's a lot of players that Newcastle have got that I would love to see us keep and loan out like the big clubs do. And I know it's not always easy, and players want to play, but I'd love to have seen us keep Tony and Adam Armstrong. And like I mentioned Jamie Sterry, uh, Dan uh, Dan Barlas is another one. There's there's loads actually. There were oh. Uh, uh, and Babu was another one. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So he's now the, the Switzerland uh, first choice left back. Um, we sell these players and I just think, just keep them. We sell them for minimal fees. Just keep them and just loan them out, see where they go. Tony, I'll tell you what, the way he's taking his, his, his two goals last night uh, for Brentford, he's a worry for me. And he's, we, we sold him and he's, gonna, he's got a chance to come up in a cup quarter final against Newcastle, the club that let him go. And he's on fire. Can't remember. I think he scored seven goals in four matches, so he is a worry. But yeah, I agree. If we're, if we're going to win anything, it's that. It's it's going to be the uh, the league cup. Um, and it's you know when you know when I say to my son, "Oh, the last thing we won was in 1969. It was the Fairs Cup." And he goes, "What's the Fairs Cup?" And I go, "Well, it's kind of like it became the UEFA Cup. Now it's a bit it's a bit like the Europa League, but it's different." And he's you see, he's just not not impressed by it at all. He's like, it's not really. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was honestly. But I, I, when they were talking about this, this whole woman project, big picture thing, and they were talking about scrapping the league cup. I thought this is what's going to happen: Newcastle will win the league cup, and then it'll fail to exist anymore. <laughs> my son will be in the same position I've been in. He'll be telling his, his my grandson in years down the line. Yeah, but we won a thing called the Carabao Cup, you know, once in two thousand and. In twenty, and there is some of me going. What's the Carabao Cup? Like, well, it's kind of a bit like this uh, this European this European <laughs> cup that we've got now, but it's slightly, it's not a real trophy, is it, Dad? And you'll be in the same position in years to come. Uh, but no, I, I I think the League Cup's obviously the one that Newcastle got the best chance of winning. Um, uh, like you say, the big clubs don't. But then you look at the other teams that are through. We, Steve Bruce he can't say anything about his luck in the draws. I mean, he got he got brilliant draws all the way through in the FA Cup last season till City, of course, in the quarters. And uh, and he's got probably the, the the one the draw you'd want all the way through this time as well. So it would be great to just get the semi final. It'd be great to beat Brentford, put out a really strong team, get to a semi final. And once you get into those last stages, as well now you've got ninety minutes. He's quite good at keeping it tight, Brucey, isn't he? And and. Uh, you know, our penalties weren't bad in the last game. So can we have to try and draw every game nil-nil and win on pens. Just do it. It's just the play five at five at the back and uh, and let Maximan and Almiron be the only players that you allow to just go on one. <laughs> and see if you can either eat, eat nick a goal or draw nil-nil and, and win on pens. But yeah, I'd have the lads practicing pens every day. I'd scrap everything else and just practice pens from the end to the end of the season. <laughs> yeah, go on, Sam. I'll, I'll let you uh, ask uh, another question, and we'll I'll give Pete's final question. It's, it's just right there about the academy, isn't it? I mean, it's nearly happened again with Matty Longstaff. I mean, he's only signed a two-year deal, hasn't he? But it's, mm. it's so frustrating. You look at the top of the championship uh, scorer charts now. It's Tony one, Armstrong two. And when yeah. we spoke to when we had Carly Telford on the on the channel a few weeks ago, she said the northeast, most of the Lionesses squads, full of the northeast lot. So it's just such a hard yeah. talent. It's yeah, so yeah, yeah, loads of good, great play, uh, players in the women's game come from up in the northeast. Yeah, absolutely right, including the England captain, of course. Steph. Uh, yeah, like yeah, this we've never been great at keeping hold of our. It's not just now; it's always been the case. And you look at Alan Shearer. I mean, we had to sign him back as a world record transfer, and um, she'd never been allowed to go. And uh, but it, look, it. 
We don't know the ins and outs, and I don't know the ins and outs. So to be fair to the club, there are agents involved. Um, the, you know, the players' happiness, how much are these players desperately trying to get away because they feel they're good enough to play, but they're not ready for our first team? And you talk about loan in the mountain, they're like, no, I don't want to go on alone. I want to leave. You don't know what's gone on behind the scenes. So maybe, um, you know, maybe there was that. So I, you, know, you can't, unless you know the ins and outs of it, it's hard to say. But I just wish Newcastle could find a way to keep hold of these lads. I just wish they had Tony now. If, if, if Tony was still a Newcastle player, A, he wouldn't be able to play against us in the quarterfinals. <laughs> but uh, also, you'd be thinking, you'd be looking at it. I watched him last night and you'd be thinking, well, I'll tell you what, next season, you, you we might, you, oh, we could get him back in January and he might, you know, he might be someone who can really, you know, obviously Wilson's going to be starting, but I'll tell you what, Tony looks like someone who could put a lot of pressure on you, your Dwight Gale and your Andy Carroll, you know. Um, and Adam Armstrong is just, he's black and white through and through, a lovely family from up in the Northeast and he would have, you know, loved to play for the for the club and, and, and he's, he's, he was brilliant the last couple of seasons in the championship. And, and he's another one who I'm not saying he's going to start in the team, but you look at him as a, someone, as, as someone who you could bring on if, 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 if Mickey Almer on when they get an injury, he's a different type of player. He's like a 10, but he just, he just would have given us another option in the attacking third. We've got a lot of good attacking players, but just would have been another option, you know, I think potentially, but it is what it is. I don't run the football club, but if, if I, if I did, I would, I would try and keep players like that with it, you know, on the books, if I, if I possibly could. It's not always possible. Of course, it's not always possible. This is the fi your final question, Pete. Um, what has been the best part of your career? Has there been a moment where you've been broadcasting on Newcastle, just broadcasting on a particular story while you've been at Sky, for example? Has there been one moment where you've just gone, wow, I've just been managed, I've just managed to do something like this? Uh, <clears throat> it was it probably pre-Sky. It would have been the Bobby Robson um, documentary I did when I was at Century Radio because... Um, I it started with I asked it asked if if I could do a five minute interview with with Bobby, and um, and we started talking and I went and I was talking about his life as a kid and that five minute interview turned into about five hours of going back to see him various times and then me and my wife had dinner at his house and um, and in and, and, and sort of had a just a, it was really late in Bobby's lifetime and. Um, and I just felt so privileged. It was something I never thought that I would do would be to get sort of just even a small bit of a relationship with with, with him. And uh, yeah, and, and, his, and his, his lovely wife, Elsie, and, and everything. And, and the foundation still continue to do an amazing job. And that that interview with him, I still listen back to it. And uh, and that was that's that's the thing I'm probably most most proud of. And it was pre pre Sky. Um, I, you know, I, I love working at Sky Sports, or you know, as well. And, and I've had, I've been lucky enough to cover some massive stories. Uh, when you go to Sky, you, you're part of a, a big organisation, and, and, and when you when you're reporting stories, it's not just your information; it's information coming from different journalists within the team. It's an amazing team. I love doing the Transfer Talk podcast, which I host on that as well. Um, so, but now the Bobby Robson thing would be the one that the one that stands out uh, most. But I, I think just getting to know that know your heroes on a personal level um, is is great. And I'm talking about you know I mentioned Kevin Keegan, so Bobby Robson, but all all the players from that that Keegan team as well. A lot of them are, I know very very well indeed. You know, and uh, they're all you know all top lads as well. But you know the whole team, your, your Shearer, your Rob Lees, you know. Your, Steve Howie's, you, you know, you David Ginnellers. I was with Ginnellers the other week, and we got him in on deadline day. Um, Andy Cole, I spoke to on deadline day as well. I speak to Coley a lot, and and uh, you know, and all the all the players that I grew up watching. I speak with Gavin. It, my, my hero when I started watching was Gavin. You know, he Gavin Peacock, he David Kelly's. They were my heroes, you know, and still speak to Gavin as well. And he's got a book coming out, which I was, I was speaking to him about the other day. Just to, the very fact that I, if I think, in, and Mickey Quinn was my hero as a, as a kid as well, and I speak to Mickey, but I think if I'd have told the, the young version of me, the me that was on the front page of that program, that uh, I would do the job I've done and, and, and I'd meet the people that I've met and, uh, you know, I, I just wouldn't have, wouldn't have believed it. So I've been, uh, I've been extremely fortunate and, uh, and I know I've been fortunate. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely thankful for, for the opportunities that I got. Very well said, Pete. I think the words about Sir Barry Robson in particular, I think you've won very lucky lad, but you've worked hard to get to that lucky moment maybe in your, in your mind. But again, 
it's been a fantastic hour, Sam, hasn't it? And yeah. I think we could have spoken for another three, four hours just on Savoy Robson and all the memories of Milan and oh. it's getting so close in, in oh, Europe and the UEFA Cup as well. Yeah, yeah. cracking. Yeah, oh, just, that era was brilliant, that Champions like oh, two, oh, two, oh, three season alone is just brilliant. But yeah, no, that was superb hour. Can't thank Pete enough uh, for his time today. Absolutely superb. Yeah. By an old game, man. That Bellamy goal is one of my. I wasn't at the game, but watching it on the telly, um, it just was one of my great TV football yeah. watching moments. Just jumping around the living room and yeah, absolutely <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal times. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on for the last hour talking all things Newcastle United. Um, Again, if you want to watch this podcast, it'll be available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, and of course, Podomatic. If you can leave us a review and tell us what you enjoyed about this interview, that'd be absolutely brilliant as well. But, Pete, again, thank you very much for your time. And again, we can only wish you the very best in, obviously, your career with Sky. And if hopefully we'll get your wish, we'll get to see Newcastle in a full house, hopefully not in a too distant future. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Good luck with the uh, with the the channel and everything else. And uh, yeah, if you ever need me on again, you've got my number. Pete, thank you very much. And Sam, the last word goes to you. I think um, brilliant. Yeah, absolutely superb. The guests keep getting better and better. So, Johnny, our offer from Spotify for a hundred million can't be that <laughs> far away now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For myself, Jonathan Green, Sam Milner, and our very special guest Pete Grace. We'll see you all very very soon.